The first time when I saw on Instagram a gay Pacific Islander couple, I cried, you know, because you would have never saw that on social media. Now I see it all the time and I'm really sick of it. <laughs> no. um, I'm just so proud that men and women can show their love, you know, and, and not be ashamed of it. We're bringing you a five-part series on queer and trans Asian Pacific Islander history. For this episode, we actually got the idea from a YouTube video of San Francisco Pride Parades from the 70s and 80s. There aren't that many people of color visible, but there's a moment when you see folks marching in what looks like Samoan traditional attire. So to find out more, we decided to go to Seattle to talk to Utopia, one of the most active queer and trans Pacific Islander groups in the U.S. We are preparing for our annual luau. This is how we are able to provide resources for our community because our issues are distinct on education. If you divide the Asians and Pacific Islanders, Pacific Islanders are on the bottom of the totem pole, so we don't get that addressed enough because we're just looking at data and the numbers combined. Taffy had to get back to preparing for the luau. But she suggested that we talk to another Utopia Seattle member, Joseph Seya. In traditional Samoan society, there are four genders. Uh, there's Fafafine and also Fatane, And those are inclusive of uh, gender uh, different uh, people than just the binary, just male and female. And so we have these identities that are essentially thousands of years old. Um, and under colonization, uh, we became um, oppressive towards those identities. I've personally um, been ostracized, you know, earlier on in my life, but I was a resilient little f <laughs> and, um, you know, created and fought for community outside of that. So last year, uh, our float uh, won uh, the Seattle Pride Parade. Uh, we were chanting in our traditional uh, languages, and so it was really nice to see black and brown children just like light up when they saw us. I just mm -hmm. to show this from this is awesome. <laughs> I mean, I would uh, wait and talk to uh, Vincent uh, Christostomo, who uh, will tell you a little bit more about that video. So we took Joseph's advice and went to San Francisco to talk to Vince Chrysostomo, a gay Pacific Islander who works at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Have you seen that before? Or like, who, who do you... Like... No, I haven't seen that. Um, but Neo would, and there are a few people around. In 1989, I found out that I had HIV. And even that was kind of an eye-opener to me because I went for my first intake and there was no place to check my name off. And I remember the guy told me quite honestly, well, here's Caucasian. It has Asian at the end. Why don't you check that one? The Asian and Pacific Islander Wellness Center during its time was the largest, probably the most well-resourced agency um, targeting um, Asian and Pacific Islander folks um, in the country. But once again, Asian and Pacific Islanders are being left out. And so for me, I said, that's going to change. And so through the support of the foundation, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, we started, we're starting up a small initiative. We are looking at intergenerational work. One of the things that I've seen that's, that's I think is unique in our Asian and Pacific Islander community is that the young activists are so much more respectful of their elders like me, or alumni, as some of them call. And they really want to hear what, what did we go through? How do we find ourselves? After talking to Vince, we realized we needed to speak to Neo Vea Vea, one of the founders of Utopia. Neo is currently running for public office in San Francisco, and so we caught up with him before one of his campaign meetings. I was born in Riverside, California, but I've been in San Francisco, I would say, about 55 years. Is it the archived one? Yeah, okay. so the... So I'm in the back. When was that, you think? This parade? That was 82. So what we just watched was um, the first time we've ever marched. Everybody in that film is no longer here. The vision was to be visible every year so that other PIs can feel comfortable 
about coming out. And to look at that and see that it's almost like the last man standing. Um, our work is never in vain. When we started going out to the clubs, we would get double carded or we would walk up to the bartender and he would serve everybody around us. And we would just, you know, when you're raised as a Pacific Islander, you learn to be very humble. But it just got really to the point where you were like, F this, shit. you know, we're all supposed to be kumbaya ish, you know, we're gay, we're all fighting the same struggle, but then there was that color barrier. One of the other co founders, Julio Muo, he picks up the phone one day and he calls me. He goes, Hey, I think it's time because the whole AIDS epidemic has kind of calmed down that maybe we can come together again. And so we just planned this um, barbecue at uh, Golden Gate Park. The day of the barbecue, over 200 people showed up. And we were like, what, what did we just do, you know? Everybody just held hands. And one of our um, Native Hawaiian sisters decided to do a chant and a prayer to bless everything. And that was the beginning of how Utopia started back in 1998. When I turned 60, I decided to run for the Board of Supervisors for District 10, which is one of the largest districts in San Francisco. To be the first disabled gay father, man of color to run for this, maybe the next man or woman behind me will do it. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.